A word that I made you repeat. Heliacal. So, heliacal. Now, anything can be a, anything that rises with the sun is heliacal. How do you spell it? H e l h e l i a c a l. I think there's a new North Star coming up. Was it in fifteen thousand years? In th about thirteen thousand years, the North Star will be Vega. Okay. Yeah. But in yeah, I mean, Sirius is still going to be. Even in 13,000 years, the motion of the stars won't be so much that you would, couldn't go out in the night sky and recognize most of the constellations. That's the galactic, the blue line is the galactic plane. Now in, in the movie, see, these are still images of the movie. So in the actual movie, you'll see this. This yellow line is the plane of the ecliptic. The white line is the celestial equator. The blue line is the galactic plane. And this line right here, separating the plane of the ecliptic from the celestial equator, is the solstice line. So where, where this line and this line cross is the solstice. And the solstice is moving slowly. And what is happening is that on December 21st, 2012, the intersection of those two lines, which is moving, is going to cross the galactic plane. And this right here is the galactic center. So the sun is here. Who's the galactic center? Right here. Right there. Come up here. Come up here and you can see it. That little blue dot is the galactic center. You'd think it would be like this big old thing, wouldn't you? That's it. Well, it's see, the galactic center is really just a theoretical point. At this. Elizabeth, what you're looking at, you notice that that thing, it's like an oval shaped white cloud. And you see it coming on the blue line from the top down. Yeah. There's a dust cloud. Yeah. That dust cloud is obscuring nearly all of the middle of the galaxy. And the only way you can see through that is with the radio telescope. Right. This right here is the dust cloud. Yeah, that's that galactic dust you've heard so much about. Oh. And that's why you don't see any stars or anything oh. through there. And that's concealing the center of the galaxy. And it's very possible, probable in fact, that there's a giant black hole right there. Oh, lovely. Did you get sucked into it? Uh, yeah. That's, well, that's what's going to happen on... Uh, Where did you download these? I did. I, I made these. I created these with this software that I oh, bought. Okay. All right. That new software, that Voyager. Voyager four point five. Yeah. Okay. North is on the left side, isn't it? On this diagram. Is that the ecliptic? Yes. This would be like if we're laying on our back. This would, in fact, be high noon on the twenty-first of December two thousand and twelve, laying on the. Uh, yeah, this would be if you were at laying on the Tropic of Cancer, 23 and a half degrees north of the equator, so that it looks like the plane of the ecliptic is directly over your head. So, so you, would, you would never actually be able to see this because the sun is right here. You'd be staring straight into the sun at high noon is what you're looking at here. So you're not even going to be able to see this right here. You won't be able to see this conjunction of sun with galactic center. But that's, that's the deal. I mean, that's what's happening as, as astronomically. So is this a significant thing astrom astronomically-wise? Well, what do you think? Well, I'm, I'm more an astrologer-wise person than a... Well, it's significant in that if you, if you actually learn what this is and you understand, and I'm sure nobody really in here gets the picture of what it means that this thing here is the celestial equator, and this thing is the plane of the ecliptic. And what that actually means, if you were able to go out, at, say, for example, in, at night, and actually find those in the sky. But this is the constellation, and I'm going to show you. I, I, you know, I actually could simulate this, because even though I recorded a movie, and I can't play that, I could actually rerun the Voyager and play that movie for you. But what you would then see is that over a succession of the next couple of years, this point is moving across, across this line right here. 
So it's that configuration that is astronomically and presumably astrologically significant. And what does that mean? I'm not sure. What it means to me is that the whole, it, it, it's, you know, these are one of the four stations within the great year. You've got the two, the, the spring equinox and fall equinox. You've got the summer solstice and the winter solstice. Those are the four stations. In order to get that picture of the, the great wheel, which is the, the great year, the processional cycle, you need to be able to picture those four stations within it. And ritually, those were the four stations represented by the cross within the circle. Or the tempor quaternor, I guess they're called, of the, the Catholic ritual, where there would be four stations, each associated with one of the four evangelists, or also symbolized by the four fixed signs of the zodiac, which make a right-angled cross. And so you've got this right-angled cross. If you can picture the, this cross within that circle, at each of the ends of that cross are the four stations. One is the equinoctial line, the other is the solstitial line. And if you take that from Earth and project it into the cosmos, you see that's what we're looking at right here. And the end points of those lines, the solstitial line, the end point of it is this right here. And it's rotating. So as it rotates, what is happening is that it constantly is moving with respect to the background of space. So on the winter solstice, in two years, three years, it's going to get as close to the galactic center as at the winter solstice. Now in 6,480 years approximately, which is one quarter of the way, you would then have uh, fall equinox falling over this point. And in another 6,480 years, or roughly 13,000 years from now, it would be this, it'll be the summer solstice that is intersecting this point. But it's not getting close to the black hole. It's just changing when it hits on planet Earth. It's different yeah, places. see, it's all being sucked into the black hole. So what, we won't notice that probably until about November. Oh, stop. Then, oh, stop it. <laughs> I'm talking about like billions of years down the No, I think the galaxy is expanding. I don't know. So I couldn't. Out instead of in. I don't know whether. I, you know what? I honestly don't know if in a couple of billion years the gla galaxy will even still exist as we know it now. It's probably going to merge with another. Yeah, that's probably going to happen. It's probably going to merge with that drama. In fact, they, uh, I saw something just in the last couple of days that they did a, a, a study the last few months and they think there's about. Uh, they were off by about uh, one, uh, one to three margin, but they think it's about 50% more mass in the Milky Way than they estimated previously. Here's another perspective of the same, of the same view, except now the celestial equator, the white line, is to your right. So let's think about this, and I'm going to see how smart you are. If you're laying like this, in the plane of the ecliptic, the yellow line, is directly over your head, and the celestial equator is to your right, and you're laying on the ground looking up at this scene, which direction are you facing? Which way is your head pointed? South. Sam says south. There we go. Let's see. You're laying here and your head is this way. The celestial equator is to your right. So if, you're, if this, this, this is the Tropic of Capricorn here, this yellow line. So you're laying there and you're looking straight up at the Tropic of Capricorn. This would be high noon. Again, you wouldn't see any of these stars because the sun is right here. If you're laying on the ground and north is to your right, which way is your head facing? East. East, yeah. So if, you're going, if you go down to the Tropic of Capricorn, Southern Hemisphere, and this, I suggest go ahead and do this on winter solstice. Go down there and find a nice spot on 23 and a half degrees south latitude and lay down. And uh, at high noon, <laughs> stare up into the, <laughs> into the zenith, right in the top of the sky. And there's what you'll see. You'll see the, the galactic equator, which is the blue line, See, this is the Milky Way. This stuff you're seeing here is the Milky Way galaxy. So that's the whole point of this 2012 business is that there's going to be an intersection between 
the winter solstice and the, the point of the winter solstice and more or less the galactic center. You see the galactic center here? Right? Right? Ah, I don't know what's wrong with this damn thing. It's not working right. Nothing's working. We're having technical difficulties tonight. There's the galactic center. No. No, yeah, what, what, what's your question? Was the equinox, those two vertical lines, the, the uh, intersection? It, it, good question. Jeremy just said, if this was an equinox, would these two lines be intersecting? And in fact, if you look here, you'll see that there's a bulge right here. This has a slight curve to it, doesn't it? Okay, so if you follow that curve down, yes, it's going to meet. The two lines are going to meet down there and up there. So yes, that's correct. Those two lines would intersect if it was equinoxes. And right there, that's where that is, you see, is the maximum separation of those two lines. See, so that's a 23 and a half degree separation. And I wish that, you know, the movie I'd made of this, I could run it. Because see, the movie shows it like from several days before even to several days after. So I can run the movie and then I can actually play it backwards. All right, now there you asked about the equinox, Jeremy. So there you see the yellow line and the white line crossing. And this would be um, spring equinox on April 9th. This would be by the Gregorian calendar, 2,226 B.C. About 4,002. So this is about going back to the old kingdom of Egypt. Um, and this would be... What you would see uh, at the morning of spring equinox, the green line represents the horizon. So what we have here in the larger picture is, what is this right here? What is that? Yeah, exactly. It's the Pleiades. So if you would, were to go out and watch the sunrise on the morning of spring equinox 4,200 to 4,300 years ago, you'd see it occurring right along with the Pleiades. Now what might be significant about that? 4,200 to 4,300 years ago, what happened? That was the collapse of what? That was when all, that's the, the, when all the Bronze Age civilizations collapsed. Mm, well, it was something. Something caused a simultaneous collapse of Bronze Age civilizations. Four or five great civilizations all bit the dust within one century of each other, maybe even within like one decade of each other. Astronomically, at the time that happened, this, this was happening. Now, what do we, have we learn to associate with the Pleiades? What else? Meteor Absolutely right. Which which one? Pleiades. No, no, no. Pleiades is part of what constellation? Gemini. No. No. <laughs> All right, class. Class. I'm going to have to have mass detention here. Come on. Pleiades is part of what constellation? Brad, tell him. Taurus. Taurus, the bull, right? Haven't you, don't you remember Mithras stabbing his sword into the heart of the bull? Yeah. And the blood flowing out? And the seven stars representing the Pleiades? So yeah, so here we have spring equinox, 4,200 to 4,000. What you would be seeing here is over a period of a century, this rising point of the spring equinox. And you see... What will happen is the next day, this sun here won't be here. It'll be down here. And the next day, it'll be down here. Moving away from this, X marks the spot. So this is spring equinox right here. Right to, and this is the horizon. See, what's significant is the meeting of these three, the crossing of these three lines. They're like the, the, uh, the, the crosshairs, if you will. The crosshairs. Think of the crosshairs. And what is right there in the vicinity of the Pleiades? What is there? Great cursor in the sky. Well, 
Bill, you said it. That's the word I wanted to hear. What? Say it loud so they can hear. The which ones? The Torrids. The Torrids, yes. The radiant point. What we're seeing here is the X marks the spot of the celestial equator and the plane of the ecliptic is crossing the radiant point of the Torrid meteor shower. Now. At that very time that this is happening, we see a collapse of civilizations all over the planet. These are the connections I'm trying to get you to make in your mind, see, because... Is the lighting up of the sun and the Pleiades stimulating the, the, astro, uh, the, the shower? Not necessarily, but it certainly is somehow indicating the timing. Okay. You know, that, that is really strange because all that had to been set up long before that crossing occurred. For the comment well, see, what this brings into mind, if we could demonstrate several examples of this, which we actually could, we could also demonstrate it for the Leonid shower and the intersection of this crossing of these lines with Regulus, the heart of the lion, and the influx of the, the Leonid meteor shower. If this could be established, what I would then look for is what kind of gravitational resonances are going on here such that it causes an alignment of the meteor streams with these particular celestial geometries. That's what I was asking. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's exactly what I want you to be thinking in your brain because this is, th that's a possibility here. That well, it's still a matter of the timing. Those things have to come in from outside the solar system. It takes them a long time to do it. Well, they, they, they come in and they go on to orbits. That orbits are regular. And those orbits will change through time. Let me try something here. Um, let me show you something here if it'll work. Um, oh, well, before I do that, why don't we set up for Atlanta? Location, I've got it. Okay, we're at Atlanta. Good, we're at Atlanta. Okay. So, let's change the get those trees out of the way go here go um, let's go a nice mirror lake okay now we're at this we're we're standing on the shores of Lake Lanier looking out right now we're looking to the north Navigate your way around. This should be looking familiar to you all now. Where is the North Star? Right there at the end of the Little Dipper. Right there at the end of the Little Dipper. Exactly. Right there. Okay. And then what do we see? Do we see Cassiopeia? Cassiopeia. Yeah. Right. No, not yet. Yeah, it's right there. Yeah. It's right there. Here, I'll use my cursor. This is it right here. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's Cassiopeia. Yeah. Now let's turn our turn over to the east. Let's turn over to the east and see what's happening in the eastern sky. Um, this is probably not. Let's make sure that we are right now. No, we're a couple hours ahead of ourselves here. There we go. There's now. Okay. Ah, there's some pretty major stuff going on. We see. What's this big old bright thing? There's the star we were talking about two weeks ago, the dog star, Sirius. Should I put on the mythological figures? You like that, don't you? You'll see the mini dog here. Uh, display figures, show mythological figures. Okay, there we go. Do you see the little little puppy dog? That's the little dog. That's pretty darn big stars. Yep. <clears throat> and both those dogs. Well, there's Canis Major and there's there's the puppy. I think that's pronounced Procyon. Does anybody know how exactly? Procyon? That sounds sexy. Procyon? Yeah. That's the little dog. And Sirius is the big dog. Anybody see Gemini the twins? Let's. Where's Gemini the twins? There's, there's the twins. <coughs> really? Oh, 
Yep. Okay, now let's watch what's going to happen over the next hour. Facing the east. Okay, so what do we see coming up on the, hor the eastern horizon? Okay, which way is east here now? Sam? Right straight behind me. This way, straight behind you is to the east. This house sets seven and a half degrees off of Okay, so this is to the east. So we've got this 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 scene right here is rising That's right. off this. Okay, let's try something now. All right, this is what it's doing. Let's. So Leo is coming up. Let's stop it. And see, okay, here we are. This is at almost 11 o'clock. So you can see Leo is above the horizon. Saturn is, is moving through Leo, isn't it? And what do we see just coming up on the horizon? Right down there. Saturn's in Virgo. Well, okay, now what, what Verlaine said, we were talking about this some last week. The... The signs and the constellations that gave the names to the signs have become offset as the result of precession. Well, there's Orophyncus, and of course, you know, the sun is actually... Orophyncus. I think it's Orophyacus. Orophyncus. That's his brother. He, he didn't get... They didn't find a spot for him. It was... Or. Okay, so now this would be, now this is like 2 o'clock this morning. So you can see Virgo is completely up over above the eastern horizon. And Leo just rose. So as Leo is rising, what's setting in the west? Aquarius. Aquarius, right. So you've got Leo rising, Aquarius setting in the west. So is Saturn actually going up towards the lion or down towards Virgo? Is it You know what I mean? It's moving towards Virgo towards Virgo. In fact, let's see, let's try something. Um, stop. Put this on sidereal day. Every day. You have solar time and sidereal time, and the fixed stars rise three minutes earlier every day. Yeah. They're on a 366-day cycle. I'm going to put, I'm going to put the plane of the ecliptic up there. Uh, there's the ecliptic, the celestial equator, put the equinoxes, the solstices, we'll show them. Let's apply that. There they are. Okay, we've put the, remember the yellow line is the plane of the ecliptic. And it, remember, the yellow should help to remind you that it's the sun. Because the plane of the ecliptic is, is defined by the exact path of the sun in the sky. Okay, so there's Saturn up there. You see Saturn? Now I've set this to the cycle of the sidereal day, and let's see what happens when I do that. Watch Saturn and see if it moves. What's that thing shooting by? It's a UFO. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a it's a moon. It's a moon. It's a moon. Here comes the sun. This is like this is what you'd be experience if you were on a time machine. Let's make one. Well, this is sort of like one because, see, we can just move it forward. I'm going to go back to now. Now here we see the galactic plane, and there's the summer solstice. Do you see the great bear? And there's the North Celestial Pole. What's the North Celestial Pole? What is the North Celestial Pole? Polaris. Yes. What's the North Ecliptic Pole? That's at right angles. Do you have your globe here, Sam? Is it in the room? The North Celestial Pole is the pole of the Earth, the North Pole of the Earth projected into space. So if I were to orient the Earth, 
However, I would have to orient it. So this line pointed to right there. Now the ecliptic pole is the center around which the Earth is rotating through the great year. See, there's actually another circle around like this, and on the opposite side of that circle, you'll see Vega, because Vega is the pole star half a cycle. Half a cycle into the future, half a cycle into the past, the pole star would be Vega. And so what is happening is during the processional cycle, as the Earth's axis rotates around, it's rotating around that point, very close to this, the head of this serpent right here. And let's see if by pulling this up like this and taking away the um, horizon, let's get, let's make the ground transparent so we can see through it. Okay, now the green line represents the horizon right? Okay, so that's the same image as before except that we've made the ground invisible as if we could look through the earth. And now, do you see what I was saying? The other pole star? Vega, right there. And here's the north ecliptic pole right around that point, right there. So what is happening is during that processional cycle of the great year, it's moving around around that center right there. And in 13,000 years, the North Celestial Pole will have gone around the arc and it'll be almost sitting on Vega. So you'll notice that the two most prominent stars on that circle, let's see, now this might be Thuban, I think, right here, which is close to that Nodeneb. Yeah, that's the swan, right. And there's Vega. And then, of course, that's Polaris right there. And this should be Draco, the dragon, I call And what do we associate with Draco the dragon? The Draconids, yes, the, the Draconid meteor shower. Is there any connection to the sun with the Draconid, Draconid meteor shower? Well, uh, of course there is because the, the, the whole stream is orbiting the sun. But I mean like what we did before, where the sun and the... You know what I mean? We're equal. Well, I haven't, I haven't actually tried any simulations on that, like I have the Taurids and the Leonids, so I can't answer the question. It would be surprising if it was, right? Maybe? Right. And see, I don't, uh, also I would need to correlate that with data, like for example, how old is the Draconid meteor shower? When did the comet that spawned that Draconid meteor shower, when did it first come into the inner solar system and start orbiting? I don't know any of that. I've got a lot more information on the history of the Taurids because there's been a lot more work done on the Taurids than the Draconids. So it's, it's more possible to recreate scenarios. More recent. Exactly, exactly. Would any of the great die-offs be uh, an indicator of when these... Well, I would, I would think that would be... One, one die-off at 560 million years ago, one at 420, one at 290. Well, the problem with that is, is that the, a meteor stream doesn't, its lifespan is not that long. A meteor stream, the lifespan of a meteor stream might be, say, 5,000 to 20,000 years. Maybe a little longer, depending on the size and mass of the progenitor comet that created it. Like, obviously, the Torrid system was spawned by a huge comet, because there's no other meteor stream that has as many... Um, subfamilies within it.